our uh, panelists this afternoon. Um, we have Tammy Horak, who is the Chief Deputy Assessor at DuPage Township in Will County. We have John Vaden, who is the Harlem Township Assessor in Winnebago County. Thanks, John, for waving. Um, Hello. And, <laughs> and then we also have Don Kelton, um, the Menard County Supervisor of Assessments, and Alex Simpson, the Williamson County Supervisor of Assessments. So we've got, you know, a big chunk of the state represented. Um, we've got both township and county offices here. Um, so um, hopefully between, you know, one of the four here, any questions that you have, you know, we can get you pointed in the right direction. So uh, thank you panelists for joining us today. Uh, before I actually um, go on to this next slide here, um, you know, John and I were talking at the beginning um, as we logged in that um, we have, you know, a list of a few topics we were going to discuss on new construction, but there was one that he thought of that he wanted to include that we're going to just start off with. Um, so, John, you had some things about budgeting when it comes to new construction that you wanted to share with the group. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, as Amanda said, I know that this class focuses on assessing new construction. However, I felt one of the uh, major important um, components of assessing depends on the assessor's budget. Um, obviously, this will more often than not determine the tools that are to be used. Um, some examples might be what sort of camera system we're allowed to purchase or what we can afford. Um, others might be some other valuation services such as Marshall and Swift. Um, other issues might be some web subscriptions, uh, either aerials, um, photo data, uh, multiple listing services, all sorts of different components. Um, my township consists of 16,077 parcels, um, and it's broke out in approximately 14,866 residential parcels, 536 commercial properties, 486 industrial properties and about 189 farms. So what this means is, is that um, the Harlem Township levies about 1% of the tax base. So this results in my budget being around $270,000. And this, this includes paying staff, all the subscriptions, all the dues, uh, the vehicle costs, supplies and training of everything. So I just wanted everybody to be, um, especially if you're a new assessor, please take your budget into consideration. And if you can work with the previous assessor or other assessors that are local or might be near you and you can um, consult with them and talk to them, uh, I, just, I just felt that the uh, budget was a very important um, component in talking about new construction, especially for assessors that are just coming into the office. Yeah, very, yeah, very important points. Um, before we move on to the next topic, um, did any of the other panelists have anything? I know we kind of spur this one. This wasn't in our initial plan, but did anyone have anything else you wanted to to mention about budgeting before we move forward? Nope. All right. Awesome. So I am going to um, give the floor to Tammy, and she is going to discuss um, the importance of setting office standards. Um. So to start off, um. I, I come from a large jurisdiction. Our township is about 28,000 parcels. Um, and we have a lot of commercial industrial as well. So having to um, set your standards, if you're a small township that is um, growing steadily or even fast, you really need to get those standards in place so you're not trying to play catch up later. Um, and just try to keep it very simple. Um, it's mass appraising and you don't wanna overthink it because you might overwhelm yourself. Um, choose what to value in your area and um, try to be consistent because you know, we, we have to have equity, whether it's throughout the township of what you're going to do or if it's by subdivision of what you're going to be doing as well. Um, I can give some examples um, for um, valuing the properties. Um, we have like a list um, and you're not beholden to that list. Um, every township is going to be different. Um, for example, in our township, we don't assess driveways. There are townships that do assess driveways. Um, we have a reason why we don't do it. It's because we have a large municipality that when they first started growing in the 60s, 
um, the driveways were all gravel. And then they passed an ordinance that they had to start paving them. So we certainly weren't going to go back and value every single driveway in our township. So that's just the kind of things you have to um, keep track of. And you can always undo something as well. Um, for example, we used to value um, decks that are around pools. Um, starting this quad, we're taking those all off because we're finding that um, more often um, people are going to remove those above ground pools and the deck is going to go with it and you never know that that deck is going to be gone. So that's just the kind of things that you have to keep track of. All right, great. Um, so Tammy, I've got a question and you kind of already answered it, um, but as, um, as the assessor, um, can you choose what to value and not to value? And it sounds like yes, and that could also change. Absolutely. Um, like I said, every subdivision could be different in your township. Um, we have really high end homes that are in our area that are custom that goes all the way down to a lot of tract homes um, in our area. So, you know, in your custom homes, you're probably going to try to get to that big value that you really need. Um, as to opposed to a tract home, you might not need to value um, the simple things like a fireplace because is it really adding as much value to the overall where you have to go and look for every single fireplace in a home? Um, so you just kind of got to pick and choose by either by your township or by your subdivision. Great. Uh, so um, I'm going to go around now and ask um, the other panelists um, just a couple questions here. Um, how do you decide what to value and what not to value and how do you stay consistent? So I'm going to start with John. Um, okay. First of all, that is a very, very good question because some assessors do choose to value driveways and not value driveways. Some assessors um, put value on fencing, some don't. Um, I, I don't want to be a stickler or talk about uh, trick questions or anything. Um, I did I did refer to an attorney about this, and, and, and he told me that we should always refer back to our, our favorite word or ad valorem according to value. Technically, we should assess anything that generates value, but um, yeah, I, I talked to many assessors, and, you know, as long as what Tammy said, as long as we're being consistent consistency is what matters in the long run. So as long as you're not, you know, valuing Joe's driveway next door and nobody else is in the township, that would be where the uh, mistake would be. But as long as we're being consistent, I don't think that anybody's going to have an issue with the way that we're assessing properties. Okay, thank you, John. Um, Don, um, how do you handle what you value and staying consistent in your jurisdiction? Oh. So in our jurisdiction, we're commission county, so we don't have township assessors. Um, so we are doing the entire county. So we have differences of where we pick up sheds, where I know other counties don't, um, but it's a typical thing that does add value to some of our properties. Um, but as long as we're consistent is what we look at. We don't do rock driveways, but we do asphalt. Um, we do concrete because they're not typical to our areas. Um, and we also use anything you have to pull down the road, we assess if you have to go pull a permit from IDOT. We assess that. Um, we use that thing at stress, um, and that takes it off of us, and we're consistently using someone else's rules. That's okay. we just try to keep it as consistent as possible. Okay, and that's that's some good points that you brought up too about you know not even just consistency in your office, but across you know maybe other offices, you know not even assessment offices, but just other county offices and state offices as well. So, thank you, Don. Um, mm -hmm. Alex, um, how do you handle it in your jurisdiction? We're commissioned as well, um, so we have that same latitude where I get to make the choice. Um, I took over and our rule of thumb was 100 square feet and greater, um, whether that's a shed, a carport, a deck, um, anything like that. I know other jurisdictions around here, other counties, um, they don't do carports, but they will do the concrete underneath them. Um, we don't do concrete driveways, but we will do commercial parking lots, driveways, that kind of thing. The concrete asphalt there, but residential, we do not. All right, 
sounds good. So I think that kind of wraps up. Um, again, I think you probably all have heard this in classes and throughout your entire assessment careers, consistency, that's like the key word that probably needs to be in bold on the screen here. So um, that, I mean, as long as you're being consistent, that is the biggest the biggest thing there. So I think we're going to move on here um, to building permits. Um, so Tammy, I'm gonna give the floor back to you. Okay, so um, depending on how many permits you get in your office, I mean, we get probably about three to 6,000 permits in our um, township in a year. Um, so we really have to prioritize what is most important and what we do value. Um, and we have very limited um, staff as well. So we really have to um, determine on whether it's something that we're going to inspect um, in person or if it's something we're gonna inspect by aerials. Um, but we do what is gonna give us most value first, obviously. You're gonna do your new construction homes, your industrial and your commercial. And then um, we prioritize by um, the demolition and fires, um, because obviously that, that's the kind of stuff you wanna get um, adjusted right away um, when the either something is demolished or if a, a house is burned, you wanna be able to help that homeowner out. Um, and then we also prioritize um, the smaller improvements. Um, on whether, you know, from a finished basement in ground pools is obviously more important than doing a deck or a patio right off the bat. All right, great. Uh, so, uh, John, how do you prioritize the permits in your jurisdiction? Um, we try to prioritize by the date first and the type of construction. Um, some, some of the construction, especially industrial commercial, might require multiple visits. So if it is something like industrial commercial um, where, where it is going to require multiple visits, we'll go and try to take a picture of the foundation and then the walls being built up. Um, you know, like Tammy said, it just, just depends on the type of construction. Uh, commercial properties, whether it be tilt-up con concrete or whether it be sandwich panel, um, panel sandwich, it, it, it's going to require multiple visits. So we try to prioritize by date going out and looking at those industrial commercial properties first. And then um, the, the smaller residential stuff, uh, like Tammy had said to the finished basement, I, it, it's virtually impossible for the assessors to go look at every single finished basement. So um, if it's something like finished basement or plumbing, uh, that, that's gonna be towards the, the bottom of the list as far as priorities, um, stuff that we can view in, in out going in the van or going out and doing field work, we'll try to view that stuff first. Um, and then aerial photo and stuff, finished basement that we're not able to see that will get taken care of last. All right, sounds good. So um, first of all, Don and Alex, I don't even know if you guys have permits, but um, how do you prioritize um, what you go visit? I'll start with Don. Well, in my office, I'm fortunate that my zoning officer is my field assessor as well. Oh, nice. Um, so me and him will go out. Um, and so we're doing it based on whenever he gets the permit as they come in. And then we're also doing the second look the following year whenever we're out. Um, we also do the field checks for all the municipalities. So our ours are a lot smaller. I mean, we're talking maybe on a big year, maybe 100 permits. So we really can just go at it as we go into the area. On contrast, um, John and Tammy, how many permits do you guys get a year? Um, like I said, we get between, I mean, we probably get about 3,000 just from one of our municipalities. So um, anywhere probably between three and 6,000 permits. Okay, and John, how many do you get? Um, well, we, we get some from, we have Loves Park, okay, and then we have McChesney Park, and then we also get them from the county. So I have three different sources where I get them from. Um, a majority of Harlem Township covers McChesney Park. Uh, we probably get on average maybe three to 400 from McChesney Park, um, a couple hundred from Loves Park, and a lot less from the county being the rural areas, um, maybe a, a hundred. So I, I would say on, on a pretty busy year, uh, between 800 and 1,000 would be okay. pretty accurate. All right. Alex, what's your situation? 
So our county just passed the building permit a couple of years ago. Um, I'm looking at number nine here on my desk. Um, so we're a few and far between. Some of the cities have permitting processes. So I'd say we get a couple hundred through the years. Um, but our my field listers, I've got when they're not retired, I've got three field listers that go out in the winter months and we'll tag the cards as they go out with a post-it flag um, where they see new construction from the year prior, um, anything like that to go out through the summer to measure up when the weather's decent, um, they can do that. Um, then they'll go through and pick up the new houses, new garages, the most value to the taxpayer. Um, we'll hold off the destruction notices because we wanna pick up adding value um, prior to closing out. Um, it's always easier to send out notices per board motion, lowering values through board motion. Everybody wants to see their tax bill, their assessment go down. There's less complaints, there's less hearings that way if we lower that through the board. All right, so since you your permitting is not quite as strong as some of these other um, areas, you have to be a little bit more diligent in finding the new construction yourself. Exactly. Gotcha. All right, so I am going to move on here. Um, did anyone have anyone else have anything I, to say on this topic? I could say that you know, for anybody that has um, issues with being able to um, go out and like, because we have so many permits um after we prioritize them um we have started over the last couple of years to for example uh, an example like if it's something that's interior that for an existing house um like a remodel or a finished basement a lot of people don't want you in their house anymore after they've already moved in so we started sending letters and um and i'm finding that i get if for every 10 that I send out, I get at least eight of, or nine of them back. Um, answering the questions that I set out, you know, like what type of finished basement did you do? What's the square footage? Because I also explain that because it's permitted, they, they can get a home improvement exemption. And if you put that in there and then give them a timeline that they have to return it back to you, um, it, it's been going really well compared to if I go knocking on their door and leaving a tag saying I need to come in your house and look at your finished basement or their remodels might be something you don't even reassess for and you just wasted all that time where you could just send them a letter. That's a great idea. So thank you for sharing that, Tammy. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to move on um, to just new construction, um, kind of the boots on the ground kind of stuff. Um, John, I believe you are going to take the floor here. Yes, I wanted to uh, talk about the blueprints and how important it is, whether it be from the municipality or whether it be from uh, a developer or the construction company. It is so important for the assessors to be able to get their hands on the blueprints um, for construction material, for wall heights, um, Almost everything that an assessor is going to need to value a property is going to be on the blueprints, except for the actual photos and uh, the sketch. But uh, the blueprints and getting to know, I don't know if um, the, the panelists today have uh, the contractors that are generally come out and do uh, the track homes or, or generally it's, it's three to four contractors that are doing most of the construction in the areas. Um, a majority of them, if you stop when they're doing construction, maybe you can um, talk to the boss that's on site and uh, maybe they might give you their website and you go on their website and they've got a couple of different models that you can go at and say, oh, here's the pine crop that we just measured. And it might give you the dimensions. It might tell you about the plumbing, um, some of that stuff that you're not always able to get into if you're there a day late and the garage is locked. Um, and everything's locked up. Sometimes even the permits don't even have all the information about plumbing um, or about uh, fireplaces, uh, gas openings. So I just wanted to talk about the importance of getting blueprints and um, you know making uh, friends with uh, the the municipalities, uh, the people that 
do do the blueprints, whether it be, I, a lot of times I will receive the blueprints on a PDF or through email, and it makes it so much easier. Um, one of the other municipalities, uh, I, I have to go and actually um, look at the blueprints physically while I'm there. I can't take pictures. They just let me look at them. So I try to get as much information as I can when I'm there at that one municipality. But uh, just the importance of uh, getting your hands on blueprints or all of the construction uh, that goes into um, commercial properties and industrial properties, it's going to be so much easier when valuing um, if you can get your hands on that. All right. Is there anything else, John, that you wanted to talk about, like um, on the slide here with the on-site visit or the certificate of occupancy? Um, or with some of this Tammy, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, some of it was Tammy, I believe. And um, all I can add on to this, like you were saying with the blueprints, it is really important. Um, a lot of municipalities that are growing are starting to go digital. Our permits are becoming digital. I have one municipality. If I need to see the blueprints now, um, I can get them directly sent to me um, in a PDF. We're just yes. not allowed to save them for a long period of time. Once we're done with them, we are supposed to delete them because they are copyrighted um, for the architect. Um, but it is a huge, huge advantage when you don't have a large staff to be able to go out in the field um, to, to, to get those blueprints. And with the... Um, the note that um, John had talked about for um, track built homes, um, the majority of our subdivisions are track built and getting those brochures and talking to um, the construction company um, for mass appraising, it is such a huge um, saving in time because, you know, you know, one Arlington and they have 50 in the subdivision and they're all the same. You don't have to necessarily measure every single home. They're all exactly built the same. And it saves you a lot of time if you can come up with, you know, your assessment and then times 50 homes. Absolutely. Yep. Don, I saw you unmuted. Did you have something you wanted to add? In our county, we kind of hold the permit as ransom. Um, we will not give them a permit until they give us a blueprint. Um, oh, nice. So, um, I mean, we don't have a lot of enforcement, but we have such, uh, we don't have, most of all of our homes are custom. Um, just because of where we live. So the first thing is, is they can't get an address because we are flipping over to 911 finally. So they can't get an address until they get a permit and give us the blueprints. Um, so it kind of holds them up a little bit. And then the same thing with the owner occupied, they can't have it. If they did somehow sneak through that, um, we'll, we hold up, hold them up basically until they give them to us. Okay. That's a great point. That's a good, yeah. Alex, I saw you unmuted. Did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I would just be careful just by going by permits or assuming that everything, every of one model is going to be the same size. We ran into that situation where somebody added like two feet onto one side. Um, so the square footage was off, even though it looked almost exactly the same. It, they just added two feet on one area. So yeah, be that's... careful. Always do your field checks as well. Yeah. I do actually have one more question before we move on to um, the next slide here. Um, how often do you, for the ones that you do a field visit for, how often do you go out to see new construction and when in the construction process um, do you go out? Um, John, I'll start with you. Okay, well, first when we get the permit, um, what we'll do is we'll try to, you know, put all our permits in a row and then go view that subdivision. Um, it's usually like March, April, we'll try to get out and look at new construction. Um, and then if we do not have a certificate of occupancy yet, um, we will try to go and view the property before October 31st. That is the date when instant assessments are. Um, so for example, if a property is like 90% completed and all it needs is the brick trim um, and maybe the carpeting or whatever, uh, and, and some of that kind of stuff, then obviously that's not going to be completed for that October 31st. And if they don't have anybody in there until after October 31st, then it's just going to stay what it was um, as of that January 1st. So, 
Okay. Tammy, how often do you go um, visit properties that are under new construction and when in the construction process do you go? Um, we go, well, we do go out and look at all our empty lots um, on January 1. Um, we're almost actually built out um, in our jurisdiction. Um, so we have very few, like, like we have one track subdivision under construction and I have one court that has um, actually about eight lots that they're going to be building on. Um, other than that, we just have a lot here and there throughout the township. So we go out on January 1st to see what's there. And then um, if we have a permit or if I have a sale of a lot, then we'll go out a few months after that they're issued to see the progress that's happening. And then we try to get out there before the occupancy happens so we can get into the house. Um, and then um, we try to get there when it's finished so we can take some finished um, photographs. Um, we have aerials and they're usually flown in April. So if something was sold or started at the beginning of the year, it always gives us a good idea without having to drive out there um, right at the beginning um, to see the progress. Oh, nice. So Dawn, what about you? Um, we, we work with our zoning office a lot. So once we get the permit, we go out and take a look at it whenever we're out in the field. And then at the end of the year, he sends completion certificates to everyone and asks them as of January 1st, the following year, what percent were you complete? Um, and we use that. Um, we luckily have updated aerials too. We do only do it every three years. So we do rely a lot on honesty, um, but whenever, and so we use that. So if they say that they're done, we go, we go ahead and we take a look because of course they don't put any decks or anything like that on their blueprints. So we go out and take a look and verify that we can see what they've added. The driveways are always added to. Um, and then we, we just continue on that way. So, I mean, a new construction, maybe three times, unless it's one that just takes forever. All right, great. What about you, Alex? So they're out probably two or three times. Um, and then of course, through the winter they're out. So it'd be January 1st ish. Um, they're out in their winter driving, trying to figure out what's new. So they're going to see what's been done at the same time. So they can flag that as being complete and lived in. We don't have certificate, certificates of occupancy or completion, anything like that. So that makes it tougher on us. So we just have to use our judgment. All right, thanks. All right, we're going to move on to the next section here, um, adding improvements to the tax roll, which we already did um, dip in a little bit here. Um, I think I've got, John, I have you um, talking through this slide. Okay, yes, um, adding what was there January 1st, um, like Tammy said, obviously you're going to try to go out January 1st and view um, what is there. You cannot, uh, as far as you want to make sure that you take very, very, very good notes. Um, you value what is visible, put it on the parcel. Um, if it's not complete, needs to be put on a, a not complete or a NC basis. So it's not overlooked the next year. Um, and, and just like the slide says, have a schedule for going out. Um, if, if you go out January 1st, and then you go out another in, in March or April when the weather starts to get a little bit nicer. A lot of times there's not a whole lot done between January and March or April unless it's interior work. Um, so one of the things that we do here at Harlem is um, when there's new construction, all the new construction goes into a jacket. And inside of that jacket or on that jacket, we have... Um, boxes with completion percentage 90 80 70 and then we put the dates on there and every time that we go out in the field or make changes to those we try to make notes on on the front of the jacket so that way is we don't get confused um cuz generally we'll have somewhere between 30 to 100 new construction um as far as single family homes um and and commercial industrial just depends on uh, how the economy is going, um, how some of the uh, local factories are doing. We've had we've had one factory that has expanded greatly um, and just adding huge uh, number of square footage with all sorts of cranes, all sorts of uh, industrial components. So uh, just keeping very, very good notes and and when you're going out and and adding these improvements to the role, um, like I, I mentioned earlier, um, 
value what is visible and then put it on a not complete basis or in C, and then you're able to pick it up for the next year. All right, thanks. Uh, Tammy, how do you handle this in your office? Um, it is good to have um, a schedule. So when you are going out on January 1st, especially um, when you're writing like what percentage of the property is complete, that way you're consistent because if you have, you know, one neighbor comparing their bill to another neighbor, um, it's always good to say, well, you're at 10%, you know, your first floor walls were up. You know, um, I have my schedule in front of me, 70%, your drywall is in place. Um, that way, when you have these basic things happening, you have a certain percentage that you know, if it's done on that construction um, property, it'll be consistent with other ones. And then keeping keeping them in order, um, when we used to have a lot of growth, um, what John was just saying, that's the most important is to be able to go back to those ones you need to do right away and the ones that you need to keep um, revisiting, especially if they're a slow builder. Um, you don't want to you don't want to miss anything. All right, great. Thanks, Tammy. Um, Don, do you have anything you would like to add in this section? Nope, not really. Okay. What about you, Alex? I was going to say down here, we've got a lot of people building their own houses. So we've got to go, it's got to be at least 90% complete before we'll add a, any exemptions to it. So that's another thing to keep track of. All right. Good point. Thanks, Alex. I can't, I can't say something about commercial industrial. Okay. Um, we have a lot of it in our area. And um, when you got to treat commercial industrial different than you do a residential house on what's there on January 1st, because obviously it's going to take them That's a true. lot longer to build. Um, so yeah. our township typically will not place a value of whatever is sitting there on January 1st. Um, however, if it's been sitting there for a long period of time and it's completed, then it's going to get valued, whether we receive the CO or not. Um, I wrote on an example. So say a building was started in December of 2021. They build it all through 2022. And then in January of 2023, it's there. They just don't have a tenant. They don't have a CO, but it's complete. It's going to get valued at that point because they've already had 2022 to build through it. Um, and to go a step further, um, the first year that a commercial industrial building is built in and if it's just sitting, we do not give vacancy for that either because they are building with the intention of trying to find a, um, a tenant, just as a side note. Yeah, no, that's all super helpful. So thank you, Tammy. So I think that's wrapping up this section. So I think the last main topic we were gonna cover was a home improvement exemption. I think, Tammy, I had this back to you to kind of walk through a little bit here. Um. Okay, so for home improvement exemptions, um, we only grant them if if they are permitted. Now that's going to be a little different for um, some of the other jurisdictions because you have different permit laws. But um, if somebody does, you know, builds a detached garage without a permit, and then you discover it, you know, two years later, three years later, they're not going to get the home improvement exemption um, because it was not permitted and not all the time you can figure out when it, how long it's actually been sitting there. Um, but if it is permitted and we add a value for it, um, then we do the home improvement exemption automatically for them. Um, if um, for our smaller stuff, like small decks, small sheds, small patios, we have like a flat value system that we use for those because we have so many of them, we would have, you know, hundreds of notices going out for just decks, patios, and sheds. We started um, adding them only in the quad year. So that's when the notices go out. Um, and then you don't have to fill out, you know, the paperwork for something that's going to cost them $8 in taxes. So it saves us a lot of time too. Okay. 
Awesome. Um, before I um, ask the rest of you how you handle the home improvement exemption, um, I did plug in a couple slides here just to either refresh people what the requirements are or what the statute says about the home improvement exemption. Um, we do have the, this all came from the homestead exemptions course. Uh, so what's been on the slide here are kind of the requirements um, for a property to be eligible for that exemption. Um, so that's kind of just a refresher on those key components. Um, this next slide here um, talks about the exemption amount and the exemption period and has the uh, statute list um, statute reference here as well. So just kind of another um, refresher. Again, this came straight from the home set exemptions course. So just wanted you know, make sure we all are kind of on the same page there on what we are talking about here. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, there's a either, yeah, the, the requirement um, assessor or CCAO is required to either notify the taxpayer of eligibility or grant the exemption automatically. Tammy, it sounds like you guys with the permit, you do the automatic route. Yes, um, yes. Gotcha. Um, in, in the past, um, a lot of people didn't know about the exemption. So um, we felt that um, it was kind of one-sided when the exemption, I think, first started coming out. Um, so granting it automatically, it saves um, a lot of hassle of having to do any certificate of errors because the person forgot to file for it. So it's easier if while we're evaluating, we just fill the form out and um, process it. All right, great. John, how do you handle this exemption in your office? Um, we do the prorations based on the completion percentage of as of January 1st of 2023, or for just that year, for example, um, how much of the structure was done and completed as of January 1st in a percentage amount. Um, like I said, you only value what is visible and, and not to uh, add stuff that, that isn't there. Um, the uh, exemptions are figured in our office, depending on the construction and the permits that are pulled. Uh, the improvements are granted through the Supervisor of Assessments Office. Um, they, they do the notice as far as that goes. Uh, that's consistent throughout the whole state of Illinois, uh, four-year exemption. Um, and then on your uh, slides here, you've got the amounts or the EAV uh, for the property and the time amount. Um, I, I heard Tammy mention about um, if a permit is not pulled, or uh, if a property might be discovered um, and we don't have the information on it. Um, the way that Winnebago County um, works is that we do not give an HIE for omitted property unless the property owner can provide a construction date. Um, then sometimes, or uh, in a couple of examples, we have gone back and granted an HIE um, even though they might not have had the uh, the permit taken out, they have provided a receipt of you know when the construction was taken place, and they have gone back and put a HIE on on um, parcels before. Yeah, because there are times where you that that permit just got lost somewhere. Um, Absolutely, it's very yep. possible. So there's some you know reasonings like that. We would do the same thing, or it got taken to the county instead of a, a, a one municipality instead of another. So yeah, right, we exactly. have had that case. Yep, yep. All right, thanks. Don, how do you handle this exemption? So with this exemption on omitted property, if we do find something um, that we can identify as less than four years old, we have a letter that we send to them saying notice of potential HIE, um, kind of using that too to say, and we do require a permit for all HIEs. Um, and so we also do require them to come back in, fill it out, and give us the blueprints if we didn't have them, um, and kind of give them an idea of what it's going to add to the assessment rules. Because at that time, we are essentially guessing on what they've done. So it's an advantage to them to come in and tell us what they've done. Um, and so that helps out a lot. If it's more than four years old, we just send a note trying to get the plans. And if not, we don't give them the HIE because they've pretty much had it for free anyway for four years. All right, great, thanks. And Alex, how do you handle this exemption? So when our field listers go out to measure stuff, we've got this hang tag that notifies them of all the exemptions, especially the homestead improvement exemption, um, and lets them know how to get a hold of us to get uh, the form to them, or this one that tells them the same thing. Um, 
for them to fill out. Um, because we didn't have permits for so long, we couldn't really limit it to just permitted property. So we had we had to use Google and pictometry and our aerials to try to figure out if it was within the four year period and kind of their honesty as well to figure that out. Yeah. All right. Sounds Something good. else to keep in mind too is if you find things that have been there for a really long time, I mean, there's been times where we'll find like an enclosed porch or a sunroom or something and, and it's probably been there for 12 years. Um, obviously you're still gonna be adding that value, but you gotta make sure that you're not adding it as brand new property that you Very know true. it's gonna have a condition issue. Yeah. yeah. All right. Was there anything else um, any of the panelists wanted to say on this topic before we move to the audience Q&A? Mm -mm. We're good here. All right, we already have one question in the chat and a couple of you have already answered, you know, in the audience. So I, I love the uh, communication here. Um, but Kim asks, how do you how do people handle accessory buildings when the home already has an existing garage? Would you give a homestead improvement exemption for a pole building added? Um, well, in my jurisdiction, we don't really have um, one we have like one farm <laughs> so <laughs> that um but i do have um a small area that's rural and they do have pole barns um or accessory buildings where they use them as garages um if it's not being used for like a business then it would be something we would still grant um the home improvement exemption for so the use is the important piece here mm -hmm. That's anyone else how, would, oh that's how we how handle it in our area as well um for ag permits we don't charge but we do require them i don't believe we can charge um but then we also explain to them because they will say i put my tractor next to my lawnmower what does it consist of so we kind of weigh out the options on the hie opposed to having it paying for the permit and whatnot and hope that they tell us the truth um, and that's so if they do say it's residential they pay for a residential permit then we go ahead and give them the hie John, I would say you that's, pretty, <laughs> that, that's pretty much consistent with Winnebago County too. Um, I do not believe that they uh, charge permits for ag or accessory buildings. And generally the, the farm buildings, um, or if it's used to store implements and, and um, farm materials, uh, generally those are um, very, very basic buildings. They're not storing, um, you know, you're not storing your car in there. It's not a barn dominium. Um, nine times out of 10, it is is for wow. the tractors. Um, it might have open sides. So it is going to have um, quite a bit less value than what a um, an industrial uh, pole building or, you know, uh, there are some uh, rural properties that have uh, a, a nice uh, pole shed. And, you know, they might have a, a paved floor or a concrete floor. Some might have electric. And nine times out of ten, these these older farm buildings do not have those those uh, you know, the electrical and the paving and and a driveway going all the way up to it. So, yeah, those those farm buildings should be valued at quite a bit less. All right, thanks. Uh, so, if you guys have any questions at all, you could either pop them in the chat or feel free to unmute at this time. You know, we can keep this as a conversation. So, please bring us your questions. making sure I didn't miss anything. A few of you did post in here, you know, some of your own um, office standards on the size of sheds that you um, value. So thank you all for sharing, you know, how your office does that. Yeah, I saw the messages about the sheds um, in our area. Um, they're, because they don't really add a whole lot of value if it's just a regular shed, we do it by size. And then we have like a flat assessment we would place on them, like 100, 200 or $300 assessment. Um, if it's plastic or metal, we don't, we don't value them, um, only if they're wood. But if they are what we would call a mini garage shed um, with the roll up door, but they think it's just a shed, 
but you know that they can still pull a car in there or their motorcycles or whatever they want to store in there, um, we do value them as as a small garage and not as a shed. Okay, thank you for sharing. You know how you differentiate that. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. You guys usually have several by this point. So our presenters must have just been absolutely amazing, which you guys were. Thank you. Um, so yeah, please feel free, guys, if you've got a question to put in the chat or if you want to unmute. Um, so, you know, we're here for another few minutes here. It seemed to be a lot of, you know, there was a lot of discussion in the chat about sheds, and obviously we've already touched on it. But we do not um, value a shed um, as far as if it's personal property, if it's on like cinder blocks or if it's on, on pavers, we don't value that. I mean, we make note of it, but it doesn't have a value. The only sheds that have value is a shed that's actually permanently there. It has a, a you know, a concrete or, you know, a, a, a hard floor like that. Is that correct, John? Yes. Yes, thank you, Christine. I was just about to add that. And generally, um, like you already mentioned, the concrete pad is, is a big um, giveaway. And then generally, if it's, I think we set a standard of about 150 square feet here in the office. So I, I would say, I mean, throughout the panelists and the discussion that we've had, it, it sounds like we're all being pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. And again, this, this kind of sets the pace of where we say, you should make sure you have standards in place of how you want to do things. Um, you know, whether you're going to do a shed or not do a shed, we have some townships that don't do decks at all. Um, but now they're thinking on doing them because now they're adding a lot more value to homes than they used to. And then again, you can do that by, instead of township, you can do it by subdivision. Um, some people will value hot tubs you know, um, that are sitting outside. We don't value hot tubs, but we'll value the pad that it's sitting on. It, as long as you're consistent on what you're doing and, and set the standards. And then when something new comes along, you have to make a decision on how you wanna value um, that new item, you know, like solar panels are becoming popular. Just be careful. You're not doing something that's like kind with personal property before 1968. Right, exactly. Tracy, I saw you raised your hand. Yeah, I had a, kind of two questions and I guess I just want reassurance, but a lot of areas are now doing just like a concrete patio with their nice fancy furniture on the back of the house. And at first I was like, do I measure all those? And then I kind of decided if they attach a roof to their existing roof, then I'm going to call it as a you know open frame porch. But if it's just a you know, an eight by 12 or, you know, a simple concrete pad on the back of their house instead of a, you know, instead of a, a deck, I'm kind of trying to ignore it a little bit, but I don't know what all you guys are doing with these, these concrete pads that could or could not be a, an, a porch. So I'll answer part of that. Um, if it's on a custom home, we do go out and measure the, the patios. Um, cause our custom homes tend to be pretty expensive and they're, they're paying a lot of money for those, um, fancy patios. Um, if it's a patio that's on what we consider a track built home, um, we do kind of the same thing. Like we do with our sheds, we do like a one, two, $300, $400, depending on the size, um, flat value. And we don't measure it. We consider them like small, medium, and large and extra large. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm seeing a lot of houses that may be just, you know, enough for two lawn chairs to sit on. Right. And, I just and, and like you were saying nitpick. about the, the roof with the porch, mm -hmm. um, if it's a, um, you know how people can buy those little gazebos and they can stick them up on their on their pads, yes. we'll value the pad, but we won't value the gazebo unless it's something really solid and attached to the concrete, then we, yeah. then we'll measure and value that. Right, because that's kind of where I'm, if it's attached to their house as more of a permanent structure, I'm I'm counting it. But like I said, some of these porches I look at and I'm like, you know, two lawn chairs, really? That's getting nitpicky, you know, right. that's kind of like measuring. Just, just be walks. careful with the attached to the house rule, though, because sometimes if somebody's got a big yard 
and they put one of those big fancy gazebos out on a nice patio that's not attached to their house, it's still adding value to the property. Right. And my one other question, because I'm doing it today, is a shouse or a barninium. Um, this is pretty going to be a nice size. I mean, over 3,000 square foot. So are we using the shouse values at the Illinois um, you know, state of Illinois revenue puts out, or are we leaning towards just calling it a regular residential house? I mean, what's everyone's opinion on that? So we have these quite a bit in our area. Um, and we have them where they're truly using the other side for farm though, and they're living in the other side. Um, the way that we're doing it is we're doing it as a stick built house, but we're downgrading it, um, meaning that it's not, it's not gonna be valued the same as a regular home, but it's going to have similar qualities and we've been coming up pretty consistently, but we haven't seen a lot of sales. So it's really hard to come up with anything on here. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have to do the other half of it as a farm. Um, so they are, they're pretty complex. I think we've had five in the last year and we've done them mm -hmm. all that way, but I don't have evidence to back it up that that's correct. So I would just try to do it as consistent as possible. Yeah, because this one is just, it's a garage, but they're using metal, you know, he's calling it a shouse and I'm looking at the blueprints. I'm like, oh, I'm kind of thinking this is just a residential house and you're putting metal siding on it, you know, <laughs> yeah. so I, I'm kind of trying to decide how to call it, but. And they haven't really came across to see if they are marketable or not. Um, some folks enjoy that slab home type feeling, depending on where you live. Um, some don't. I mean, the mechanicals can go in the middle of those houses, so they are cheaper to build and they can be more efficient or can they not? Cause they're a pole barn. Um, that, I don't think that there is an answer um, yet cause we just haven't had time to see how they're gonna resell down the road. Yeah, well, I thought I would compare, like do both sides of it and then maybe see how much he actually spent on the building. He's pretty open with me. So I thought, well, maybe he'll tell me how much he actually spent and then I'll know what value to give him between the you know, my high end and my low end basically, but. And you could, or sometimes I try to look through and there's, I don't, I haven't found any PTAP decisions just to see. So if you do assess it a certain way, are you going to end up just putting it back anyway? Um, or maybe reaching out to other counties that have more that somebody has appealed. Um, I don't, it's just so hard right now with that type of property. Yeah. I said, this is fairly new. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I don't have any, so I can't give you any input. <laughs> Alex, do you have these in your jurisdiction? Yeah, we really haven't seen much on the secondary market, though. Um, what we've been doing is valuing the uh, pole barn and then doing the living area at, I think we're up to $25 or $30 a square foot for the finish within that area, hmm. plus any air conditioning, plumbing fixtures, all that kind of stuff. So it can get up there for the living area on its own. Gotcha. So I think I had a couple questions actually come through on the chat. I know you guys are, that's awesome that you guys are using this to talk with each other. I'm really, I'm really happy to see that. Uh, Kim asked if a pole building is being used for an owner's business to store equipment, I assume then most people wouldn't give an ho a home improvement exemption for that type of use. They can't receive any exemptions. Okay. So I figured that'd be a quick question to answer, but figured I, you know, there was a question mark on there. So I thought I would go ahead and ask that one. Um, some Danny was asking about how, how about a pergola? Is that valued or a big trellis? Um, we don't uh, value the pergola. We essentially say that, you know, if the rain's going to fall through it, um, you know, it's not really an open porch. I mean, an open frame porch because you're still getting rained on. However, we've noticed lately that people would put up the pergola um, you know, we'll only value the, the patio portion of it or the deck portion of it. But now they're starting to put a plastic roof on top of their pergola because they probably got rained on. Um, <laughs> so now we're trying to figure out what to do with that. Um, I've started assessing them um, as an open frame porch, but downgrading the value um, because it is a plastic roof and not a shingled roof or a wood roof. All right. Anyone else have anything to add to that question? We good there? 
I was just going to say Go at Harlem, we do the same thing. We just value what is underneath. But Tammy made a good point. If people are starting to cover the pergolas, then, you know, maybe that brings up a point where change it to an OFP and, and um, downgrade it. Mm -hmm. It makes good sense. If, if it's a cloth cover, you know, like a, oh, I don't know, just like a canvas cover where yeah, they can yeah. open and remove it. We don't value that, but Correct. I've I've noticed um, this year a lot of people are starting to put just this sheet of plastic over the top of it. All right, thanks. Do we have any other questions? Um, if you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask or put it in the chat. We still have a couple more minutes here, so happy to answer. If anyone's got a question still, I'll give you a minute to provide those. In the meantime, um, I'll go ahead and move this. Uh, so next month, our June webinar will need to have a new date. Um, the IPAI staff will be gone at a conference in Iowa. So please uh, keep a lookout. I will communicate that out to you uh, whenever we have a date about our next webinar. Um, the topic will be on mapping. Um, it looks like we do have a question that came through. Um, how do you handle old improvements being assessed for the first time, but taxpayer wants the homestead improvement exemption? If they can prove a data construction within the four years, then I wouldn't have an issue giving them an HIE. But if it's something more than four years, then you know, I, I would have to say no. Mm -hmm. Us too. We would do the same thing. We would too. Yeah, I think the law says up to four years. So. Yep. As long as it's within the four years, we can give it to them. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you so much to all of our uh, presenters and panelists today. Um, I really appreciate you guys um, coming on here and, you know, sharing your um, experience and perspectives. Thank you all for attending. Um, and I hope you all have a good rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.